Um, you mentioned that seren of radiation occurs when a particle goes faster than light in a certain substance. Um, yes. Why does the, the neutrino have to be detected um, when, the, uh, when it collides with a heavy water particle and releases an electron? Why can't the neutrino be detected going faster than light in, say, heavy water on its own rather than with a collision? Well, it, it has no charge, no electric charge, and therefore it doesn't generate light as it is accelerated or are moving quickly. The electron, on the other hand, does generate light as it is accelerated, and it is that process that produces the light. And so the conversion into, an into a fast-moving electron is essential in order for you to observe. Neutrinos themselves uh, <clears throat> cannot produce light in the way that an electron can. So I thought you were going to ask me, nothing can go faster than the speed of light. But you probably <laughs> already know that you can go faster than the speed of light in a medium, like water, or like, in fact, the glass in your glasses. It is the, uh, the fact that uh, uh, the speed of light in, in glass is different than the speed of light in a vacuum that enables your glasses to actually bend the light and focus it on your eye. So uh, uh, you didn't ask me the question I expected. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Sorry. Thanks. Um, you mentioned that uh, neutrinos only feel the weak force and gravity. Why do they not interact with the photon and the gluon that carry the electromagnetic and strong nuclear force? Well, <clears throat> uh, the photon is the, actually the carrier, force carrier for the electromagnetic force, and uh, uh, neutrinos do not uh, uh, have an electric charge and, and uh, uh, therefore do not interact with the photon. They may have a a magnetic moment. We're, we're not sure about that, but it's extremely tiny uh, if it does exist and would be uh, far too weak to have a way of interacting with photons by that process. So I hope that explained, at least with photons. What was the other thing you asked about? Uh, the, why do they not interact with strong nuclear force? Well, they, they simply don't. I mean, that's the way nature works. <laughs> Uh, the strong nuclear force uh, is something that uh, is unique to quarks, actually, uh, and uh, uh, so, therefore, uh, neither electrons or electron-type particles or the neutrinos uh, interact via the strong interaction. Yes. Another one here. And this gentleman here. Thank you. Could you explain simply why there are only three kinds of neutrinos? <laughs> Uh, no, <laughs> because we don't really know. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, it's one of the things that uh, uh, you know is a part of the uh, of the theory, and comes out fairly naturally in uh, uh, in the, the uh, overall standard model, um, but isn't a uh, isn't something that has. We don't have the basis for why the standard model is the way it is. We're continuing to look for more complete theories of everything, if you like, or a theory of everything. And uh, that sort of a theory could conceivably explain that as it is right now. If you postulate that there are three neutrino types, then uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, that works. Um, there is some thought that there might be heavier neutrinos that uh, um, are uh, unobservable so far because we haven't reached that level of energy to observe them. Um, and they would behave differently. They behave in a way that we we call them sterile neutrinos. They, they don't interact the way these ones do. Okay. One over here. Um, is there any evidence or any research into um, muon or tau neutrinos decaying into um, electron neutrinos, even, uh, even though there's a net? decay from electron neutrinos to another? That's a very good question. And in fact, um, what uh, Takaki Kajita and his group at the Super Kamio Kandy experiment in Japan observed was muon neutrinos, which are produced by the cosmic rays in the atmosphere, changing into what we now think were tau neutrinos. We know that they changed into something else, and now we think it's tau neutrinos. As they cross the Earth, it turns out that uh, as you 
what they do is look at neutrinos that come at various angles to their detector, which is essentially just under the surface of the Earth, about a kilometer down, similar to our two kilometers. And they have different lengths over which the neutrinos could do that changing. And uh, what they have observed is that they do that sort of a change. And then there's another experiment that, uh, that was done um, at a nuclear reactor where uh, neutrinos from the reactor, they're actually anti-neutrinos, but it doesn't matter. In this case, uh, neutrinos from the reactor uh, change again in a different way that relates to the third neutrino type. And so we have a, a fairly good picture of how uh, neutrinos uh, change from one type to another involving all three types. But we only know the difference in those masses. We don't know the absolute mass, which is the base for which these differences get added up. And that's one of the things we want to try to observe also with this neutrino double beta decay experiment that I mentioned. Thank you. There's one over here. Right over there, I think. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, I was just trying to, th I was thinking about the geometry of where your observatory is, um, given that it's two kilometres below the Earth's surface uh, and where the sun is. So over 24 hours, you obviously have a very different amount of Earth in the way of the sun. Sometimes it's a small bit, but the other bit would be a substantial okay. amount of it. Is that, you, can you use that in your experiment in any way? Before you answer, <coughs> I'd just like to say that I've been, I've been coming here for a little while and your talk was one of the most engaging I've ever come across. Yeah. You were just amazing. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, sincerely. Um, uh, it turns out that um, not much is the answer. Uh, that is, uh, um, it turns out there's a little bit of interaction of neutrinos with the sun and a little bit of interaction with the earth as they come through the earth. Um, and uh, that has an effect on how the neutrinos uh, change from one flavor to another, which I didn't go into because it's just another level of complexity. However, it turns out that there, uh, the, the um, Super Cameo Candy experiment has made measurements of neutrinos from the sun as well. And one thing they have been able to determine is that there's a 3% difference between the number of neutrinos that you observe in the daytime and in the nighttime. In other words, going through about a kilometer of rock or going through the whole Earth. But it's a, it's a small effect, but it is a finite effect. Yes. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, surely um, there would be a sources of neutrinos from every direction, not just the sun. There must be other stars and galaxies that also generate neut neutrinos that could come through the Earth, no? That's correct. And uh, um, it's the fact that the sun, in terms of, so in terms of stars... <laughs> It's like the difference between the brightness of the sun and the brightness of the other stars. I mean, it's basically one over the distance squared that gives you the, the uh, numbers uh, that you actually are able to observe. Um, and, and, and just in the same sense that the other stars are fainter in light, they're also fainter in neutrinos. And therefore, uh, uh, from that point of view, um, what we see here on Earth is dominated by neutrinos from the sun. Uh, in, particularly in the energy range that we're looking at. The higher energy range is dominated by neutrinos produced in the atmosphere, and that's why the Japanese experiment did, were able to look at those neutrinos by looking at higher energy neutrinos than we were looking at. But uh, in general, uh, uh, no one has observed um, neutrinos from other stars simply because they're too faint, too few. Behind you, actually, there's a gentleman. Uh, you stated that um, as the neutrinos arrive at the um, SNO, uh, there's a finite probability they'll be in a certain state. Yes. Has that model of probability incorporated anti-neutrino interaction? How does it enter? No, has, it the, if it's possible, the anti-neutrinos have affected the final outcome 
as it arrives at the um, detector itself. Antineutrinos as yes. opposed to neutrinos. Um, <clears throat> well, it turns out that antineutrinos <clears throat> um, are detected in a very distinct, distinctly different way than neutrinos. Um, an antineutrino coming into the deuterium would interact with the proton rather than the neutron, and uh, therefore we would end up with a, uh, a very different signal in our detector. And so they are distinguishable in this case. Um, and, and besides that, there are very few of them produced uh, in the sun. Uh, the processes that produce uh, the energy in the sun are produced in processes that emit only neutrinos and essentially no antineutrinos. In fact, there have been measurements looking for a very small number of antineutrinos from the sun to see whether there were transformations from neutrinos into antineutrinos in the sun. And so far, nobody has detected any that are related to that process. Uh, Hello. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> my question's on a completely different tack. Um, I was very interested in the process by which science gets done, and I was very um, interested in the huge degree of international collaboration that was involved in, in getting all this work done. You've mentioned all the different researchers from different countries. Um, as you may be aware, 52% of the adults who actually voted in this country recently voted to leave the European uh, community. Yes. I'm just wondering whether you think that organization, collaborations like that affect, will affect the degree of collaboration, or in other words, what are the factors that you think promote international collaboration in science and international research? As I was coming into Britain, there was a, uh, I was coming under the, uh, or at least I noticed the, the entrance that said EU passports, and right beside it there was this great big green sign that said emergency exit, and I was thinking... <laughs> <laughs> Wow, could I ever make a great PowerPoint slide? That would, uh, but anyway, actually, that's some of the discussions I've been having with uh, colleagues in the field of neutrino physics. Uh, people are certainly very worried about uh, what's going to happen as things, uh, particularly in, in, in the organization for uh, support of science and so on. There certainly are a number of our collaborators who are participating in the SNOW Lab that are, in fact, receiving support from uh, the European Union programs. There are fellowships that some of our uh, postdocs have that uh, uh, here in, in the UK that they are working, however, at Snow Lab that uh, come from the European Union. And so the hope is that everything is going to be sorted out in a sensible way, uh, but everyone is completely uncertain as to what's going to happen. It's just another area where uncertainty is, uh, uh, is rampant, sorry to say. Yes. Um, what do you think the risk of dark matter might be? <coughs> um, now, did you mean dark energy? Uh, or dark matter, okay. Um, well, um, as I said, it, it is thought to be some form of matter that's beyond what has been observed so far in uh, existing experiments. And, and, but there is a theory one of the next stages of the quotes theory of everything, which is called supersymmetry, uh, in which there are uh, equivalent particles to uh, all the ones we know that are called symmetric particles. Uh, and the lightest of those particles, which is also neutral, uh, is thought perhaps to be a candidate for what these dark matter particles might be. And it is thought since uh, the Large Hadron Collider is uh, uh, in the process of producing new particles at higher energies than anybody has ever been able to do before on Earth, that perhaps they might be able to produce particles of this uh, set of uh, things beyond our current experience called supersymmetric particles. And if so, then, as I said, the lightest of those might be uh, what uh, makes up the uh, weakly interacting mass of particles. It would have the right properties to be that. But it's a tremendous uh, uh, topic in theoretical physics to try to think of what could be an explanation for something that works uh, in everything you know in particle physics and also everything you know in astrophysics and everything you know in cosmology. That's what's fun about this whole thing. I mean, you're trying to consider the whole world 
And that's what's fun about this conference, actually. And the topics we're dealing with is all the way from what's happening at CERN to what's happening in measurements of uh, astronomy and cosmology and so on. We don't know, but there are possible examples that might explain it. So we don't know is the bottom line. <laughs> yes? Um, I don't know if you've heard, but there's been, there's been like a blip um, in the LHC at about 750 GeV. How old are you? <laughs> 14. Uh, Pretty good. <laughs> um, do you think that this could be an indication of uh, like supersymmetric um, neutrinos? Um, and could you detect them in a similar way to what you do here? Well, I'm, I'm really not an expert on the latest uh, information from LHC, but the scuttlebutt, <laughs> the rumors that, uh, and what you can pry out of uh, people who are working on ATLAS or CMS experiments there, um, the, the, the little bump is a couple of standard deviations perhaps, but it is in the same place in both experiments. But the properties of it don't fit exactly, I mean, the way in which it's apparently being con uh, being produced or observed don't fit exactly with at least the simple forms that you might expect something to uh, show up from supersymmetry at that particular energy. It's not something simple within that model. Um, it, it may be something new because it may be an indication of, uh, of particles stable enough to produce uh, a lot of things repeatedly, if I, if I can put it that way, in terms of why you get a bump in the... In the uh, set of information that you get out of these detectors. But uh, it, it doesn't really fit easily into uh, supersymmetry. Uh, so maybe it's something else. People think that's even more exciting. So uh, we, ha we may have to have a new theory to go along with it as well. And, Thank you. Okay. In the back. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Up there. How did you find out that there are three different types of masses, and how did they differ from each other? How did, how did we find out that there are three different types of... Mass in one neutrino. Three different types of neutrinos? Three different types of mass. Oh, three different types of neutrinos with different masses? Is that what you're asking? Well, there are three different masses. Three different on the masses. Graph. Okay. Well, um, Okay, so um, when it was observed that neutrinos changed their flavor, for the reason that I said involving the fact that they can't be traveling at the speed of light, therefore must have a finite mass, there were people who put forward theories uh, that uh, uh, explained how, if you use quantum mechanics, they can change from one type to another um, uh, due to the fact that they have a finite mass. And that, that quantum mechanical explanation that I showed you very schematically. It turns out that if you take the data from our experiment, the data from the Super Cameo Candy experiment that won the other part of the Nobel Prize, and also data from a number of other measurements, and you put it into uh, the physics formulas that you have to put forward if you say that neutrinos have a finite mass and are behaving the way I described schematically, then you find that <clears throat> There are two parameters in that set of data, which is the difference in mass between mass one and mass two, the difference between mass two and mass three. And those are things that we know now. We know those differences in mass. And all of the data so far fits with those two numbers in there. And, and those numbers are very small. They're a million times smaller than the mass of an electron, for example. Neutrino masses are really quite tiny. Um, we don't know given those two differences in mass, what the lightest mass is, and therefore we don't know the, the total, you know, we don't know absolutely what their masses are. We only know differences. But the reason we think that, they're, that these numbers have, make sense is because they're working out in six or seven experiments now, in different, done in different ways. And so it comes out of the mathematics. That's often the way it works in physics. If you can write it down in math, then you'll get a number out of it when you solve the equations. I'm not sure that I answered your question mm -hmm. to, your, to your satisfaction. But how did you measure the three different types? How do you measure the different masses? Yeah. Well, um, it turns out that uh, uh, the question of uh, 
uh, <clears throat> how can I put it? Um, let's take examples of um, uh, neutrinos that are oscillating that are produced in a nuclear reactor. Well, as you put a detector there and you move away from the nuclear reactor, then what happens is the numbers of neutrinos that you observe go down and then up again and down and up again. It's really a sinusoid. And the, the period of that sinusoid tells you what the difference in mass is for the neutrinos you're dealing with there. The amplitude is the probability of interaction, but the, the, the distance divided by the energy of the neutrinos gives you the, uh, uh, the period of this sinusoidal reaction. And, uh, uh, and that's multiplied by the difference in mass. And that you can work out from having made that measurement. It's one example. Okay. Thank you. Up, up there. The, it's one the, right the, over the, there. Yeah, the mic chip. Um, I have um, two questions, but they basically related. Um, is uh, what caused the neutrino to change the flavor and is it some? Is it during the collisions with another, if the nucleus or the add-on electrons, as you mentioned? And and the interesting thing I could understand would be why each time you change the favor, it seems picking up mass. It's okay. getting heavier than before. Okay. So uh, in the first case, um, uh, neutrinos do not have to interact with anything in order to change their flavor, uh, even if they're moving through a vacuum. Uh, they can change from one flavor to another, and it's because uh, they are a combination of masses in quantum mechanics rather than a single mass. And the quantum mechanical equations for the oscillation I was just describing uh, lead for them, lead to them oscillating even in a vacuum. The collisions are just what enables you to detect them. And the second question was, say it again, sorry. Oh, why do they have mass? Well, uh, it turns out that in order for the, and I, I said this earlier on, but I'm sure I didn't make it very clear, and it is complicated. Um, if, if they change their flavor, uh, then they must be able to keep track of time as they travel along, or distance as they travel along. And that just doesn't, it, it, it can't happen for a particle that's traveling at the speed of light. Special relativity just doesn't allow the tracking of time in a vacuum by a particle traveling at the speed of light. Therefore, the fact that they do it, the fact that they oscillate or change from one flavor to another means they can't be traveling at the speed of light. A particle that is not traveling at the speed of light must have a finite mass. Only zero rest mass particles can travel at the speed of light. 